Good morning, everybody. I'm glad you're here. Welcome back uh, for the exciting conclusion of Methodism 101. Uh, I'm, I've really enjoyed this, uh, and I'm glad that you've been um, ready to take the ride with me. Last week, I mentioned that we had to do like all of Methodism in three weeks. And so I kind of had to pick three things to that kind of sum up the tradition. Uh, and again, this is the disclaimer that this is not everything. Uh, in fact, if you're curious and you want to learn more or get into like a lot of Methodist history or Methodist doctrine or Methodist policy, I've got a whole bookshelf and we have a whole library. Uh, but this is kind of tra- me trying to highlight some of my favorite things and some of what is core to our tradition. Uh, and I'm really glad that I got a chance to do it. Uh, and I hope that it's been a blessing. Today, um, I was just saying, I think I probably have too much material. So I might move fast and we might not have as much discussion. Um, but, uh, but I'm excited to share what I've got today. Uh, and excited. It's, it's, this has made me excited again about being Methodist. Uh, so thank you for being along for the ride. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for this day and the chance to reflect on what it means to be a people called Methodist. We ask that you help us notice what you intend for us to notice today, for our sake and for the sake of the whole world. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Okay, so we've started each week with a little bit of history, and that's where we're going to start again today. So the Methodist movement um, really starts with John Wesley's field preaching, preaching out of the church because he got kicked out of the church because he was critical of the church. Um, But especially in the U.S. or the early colonies and then the U.S., um, field preaching was like a thing. Hundreds of people would show up to hear day-long sermons. Uh, And I have have no interest in that personally, but it used to be the thing. This was like pre-Netflix. So uh, people were coming out and talking about, you know, Jesus in hell, and that was captivating. So everybody came out, and it it grew really fast. Um, And then it grew, and people decided, okay, but we can't just stay out in the fields. We have to figure out a way to um, organize ourselves. And that's a little bit of what I want to talk about today, how how we've gotten organized. So... um, so, especially in the U.S., a preacher would come to town, let folks know that they were planning a revival or something like that. Um, they would set up tents, have day-long sermons uh, and music, always singing. Uh, and then they would organize folks that wanted to keep the revival going into classes, class meetings. This um, is reminiscent of that holy club that John and Charles Wesley put together uh, back at Oxford. They would set up small groups, basically, who would meet regularly for reading of scripture, praying together, confessing of sins and receiving absolution. Uh, And you might've heard of like discipleship groups or accountability groups. This is kind of where that model comes from. Um, But then there were enough class meetings that they started to organize those classes into societies. That's what they were called. And there were enough of them now that they realized, okay, they couldn't just have like day long sermons every couple months. They needed like regular pastoral care, like they needed pastors, not just preachers, and they needed sacraments because this is a a tradition that actually really highly values the sacraments. And so they started to organize churches into circuits, um, but they didn't have enough ordained people to do it. And because Methodist means mission and they want everybody to be able to hear this good news, John Wesley broke the law. He ordained and licensed two men to become pastors in America. Uh, And that moment is when we really started a new tradition. Because he wasn't a bishop in the Anglican church. He didn't have the authority to ordain. But he saw the missional need to ordain. And so he went ahead and did it. So that's Wesley the Renegade. He ordained Francis Asbury and Thomas Koch um, to the office of not just priest but bishop in the Americas for the sake of the mission, in order to reach who is not here, who needs to hear about Jesus, who needs help. Um, And that ultimately resulted in its own denomination, the Methodist Episcopal Church. The word Episcopal just means we have bishops. Episcopacy means bishops. So we were the Methodist Church, a la John Wesley, but we were still an Episcopal Church because we were organized with bishops for the administration uh, and the superintendency Superintend means like looking after 
uh, the churches that were there. Uh, and so we were suddenly a denomination that was grace-filled, missional, and connected. Except our connection didn't last all that long. What started, especially in England, as an early transracial movement was tested in the Americas. It was tested, tried, and it ultimately split over the issue of slavery. The question was, can bishops own slaves? That was the the case study that ultimately resulted in a split in the church. Through the Civil War era, there were multiple splits. So by the end of it, we had the Methodist Episcopal Church, the Methodist Episcopal Church South, um, and we also had Um, black churches, the African Methodist Episcopal Church, the Colored Methodist Episcopal Church, which is now the Christian Methodist Episcopal Church, and so on. Um, This is the cornerstone from our bell, which dates back to the church when it was on Zebedee Street, the first church building that was built. At the time, we were a Methodist Episcopal Church South. So that's why it says Grace M.E. Church South. Um, There was a North Church in town. I mentioned last week that around the time of Manassas being built, um, we were in the Manassas was in the Ripley's Believe It book of Believe It or Not, or Ripley the book of Rip. Anyway, you know what I'm saying. Uh, for being the town with the most steeples, in part because every major denomination that settled in Manassas had a North Church and a South Church, so you had two of every kind. Uh, and Grace was the South Church. Um, this is part of our history that we're, we're we don't actually shy away from. Um, it is shameful. Uh, it's sad that our ancestors insisted on retaining slaves. Uh, And yet, if we really are a church of grace, um, we don't actually have to deny that. We can instead say, yes, we needed more grace than most. Uh, And God has been faithful to this church, even though it has failed to be itself, to be the body of Christ. I'll also say there have always been black Methodists. Since the very beginning, there have always been black Methodists, but we have not always been one body. In 1939, there was an attempt to reunify the North and South Church that was successful. Um, this is, I think it's from 1939, but from the dress, I feel like maybe the, my Google search gave me a, a picture from the 60s. I'm not sure. But um, the picket sign on the right says, Methodism and segregation does not equal Christian witness. So in the 30s, as well as in the 60s, there are Methodists saying, we are not one. We are not connected like we should be. And asking for the rules of the church and the structure of the church to change so that we can more closely reflect the kingdom of God. So in 1939, the Methodist Episcopal Church, the Methodist Episcopal Church South, and the Methodist Protestant Church unite to form the one Methodist church. Still, most black Methodists are not welcomed into the conference where they live. Black Methodists are Methodists, but they're part of a segregated conference called the Central Conference. So they're saying we're one church, but you're a church within the church. You're still a segregated body within the church. So we're connected, but not all the way. We are still on the journey toward racial reconciliation in our tradition including restructuring the church to rid ourselves of the originally racist central jurisdiction. We still have the central jurisdiction. Um, Originally, it was for black Methodists. Now, it's for global Methodists. Uh, And so um, that has been to actually enfranchise non-Western Methodists, to give them a conference where they can do their business. Uh, But you can see how the racist and segregated nature of its origins still remains. Uh, They still, to some degree, live as second-class citizens within the greater denomination. Um, But the most recent general conference voted for something called regionalization, which would get rid of that particular second-class citizenship status and instead say every region is equal and people of all races, nations, and uh, ages, races, races, and nations are equal, equally represented and welcomed in their respective regions. So I wanna note the, the progress there that we are moving to change this structure um, and note that we're still trying to do something that we kind of had when we were a small group of people at the very beginning 
then we lost in the Civil War, then we tried to regain in 1939, and we're still trying to repent from it. One other um, part of the history around uh, our connectedness is where we picked up the word united. Uh, It's funny, um, people in town that don't know much about the church, um, they will say, uh, they will ask me, um, are you the pastor of Grace United? Uh, Because they think it's Grace United Methodist Church. Uh, And I usually don't correct them. I I usually just say, oy vey, like why? (laughs) Nobody even knows us. Uh, It's humbling. It's a good thing. Um, But we're actually Grace United Methodist Church. We picked up that United in the 60s. Um, But I want to tell a little bit of backstory. Early on, there was a proliferation of uh, Wesleyan and Methodist movements. They're all generally called pietistic movements, where personal holiness and a change of heart are really emphasized. Um, And so there are lots of different groups and denominations with Wesleyan or Methodist in the name. One of them was the United Evangelical Brethren. Uh, It was a pietistic or Wesleyan movement of German origin. So in Virginia, in the Shenandoah Valley, that's where a lot of German uh, immigrants settled. And um, they were doing Wesleyan and Methodist stuff in the German language. Um, And then generations went by and they all spoke English. They were less German, but they were still pretty Methodist. And so in 1969, the United Evangelical Brethren and the Methodist Church merged to become the United Methodist Church. And the symbol for that denomination is the cross and flame. So that's when we picked up the word United. We we actually got it from their name, the United Evangelical Brethren. Um, And there are plenty of churches in our conference that started as EUB churches and are now UMC churches. Uh, and, um, And so that was a great thing, a rare thing, where a church that's divided merges. Here, they, it, they hadn't really split. They just had separate cultures to begin with, but then found each other again, like long-lost cousins, and reunited. Um, and so that's where we picked up the, the name. Um, we've been UMC ever since, um, but not without um, threats to that unitedness or threats to our connectedness or our connection at every turn. And so um, with that preamble, I'm going to review what we talked about in the last couple of weeks. The Methodist Church, Methodism means grace, the grace of God for all. In week two, we learned that Methodism also means mission, asking the question, who's not here? Who needs help? Who needs Jesus? Who's not here? Who am I called to be with? Do you wonder what the third one is? It could be just mediocre. (laughs) Methodism means Mediocre. This is actually a quote from a guy named Stanley Hauerwas, uh, who's probably one of our best theologians, although now he worships at an Episcopal church. Uh, traitor. Um, uh, and, but honestly, like, maybe, maybe that should be the last word. There's something to this mediocrity. Um, generally, we are a movement that has not wanted to be very extreme. Um, and because we haven't wanted to be very extreme, maybe we haven't been that excellent at anything. Maybe we've just kind of been mediocre at everything. We want to emphasize radical grace, but we don't want to lose sight of good works and the importance of mission. Uh, we, we want to emphasize good works and mission, um, but not in a way that shames you and makes you forget about grace. We want to emphasize holiness, um, be, living a godly life, but we don't want to be so holy that we live in isolation or separate from the world that we're called to love and serve. At the same time, we want to emphasize mission and evangelism, going to be with those that aren't here. But it's not like we don't have doctrinal standards. We're not going and saying anything goes. Um, We have doctrinal commitments. We do do have some things that we actually do want to impart to others. Uh, we, We want them to grow in their own holiness at the same time. Um, so we're not, we're radical about both, but we're not extremists about either. This tradition of kind of being two things at once goes back to Elizabethan Anglicanism. Look at um, Queen Elizabeth. She's had a rough day. Um, after Henry VIII uh, founded the Church of England, um, she kind of had to clean up the mess that it created when they left the Catholic Church. And part of what she wanted to do was to find a middle ground between the Catholic and Protestant thoughts. Uh, The church was still pretty Catholic culturally, but had all these Protestant theologians said, let's do a reformation. And, um, And she kind of had to sort it out. So she 
called for what ultimately got called a via media. That's Latin for a middle way. A middle way between, the, between Catholicism and Protestantism. A middle way between extremes. A more modern way of looking at this is um, the yes and of improv comedy. In improv comedy, um, if someone comes up with something in an improvised scene, you don't say no. You don't shut it down. You say yes and in order to keep the scene running. Um, This is Michael Scott from The Office. The problem was that every scene he was in, he would somehow produce a gun. (laughs) And that uh, introducing a gun in an improv scene has a way of influencing the scene drastically. So he wasn't that good at it. Uh, instead, what he was supposed to do, and what Methodists generally have done, when um, in order to keep the scene going, to keep the worship going, to keep hold of even two seemingly divergent priorities, is to say yes and. In my experience, Methodism is not an either-or tradition. It is a yes and tradition. One of the things I've got to participate in in the last two years is called the Two-Year Academy for Spiritual Formation. It's done by the Upper Room. It's the same group that does the little devotional books that we offer. Um, But this is like spending two years, well, once a quarter, going away and spending five days in a seminary and a monastery at the same time. Lots of silence and prayer and worship like a monastery. Um, And then there's also daily lectures from two faculty when I'm away. Um, and that's much like a seminary. I mean, the seminary grade lectures that are happening there. That's, this last trip, um, one of the lecturers was Bishop He Su Jung, and um, he is uh, he's serving now. He's in Ohio. He's the bishop of Ohio, but he is an incredible man, incredibly well traveled. If you name a continent, he's generally been there, um, and mostly to learn. There was also a time when, like, he's he's called upon a lot. Like, there was a time when he had President Obama's cell phone number. Like, they, uh, he he would get consulted, or he said, "I think I need to call Barack." You know, like, (laughs) cool. (laughs) Uh, He um, was born into a Buddhist family, and then became Christian, um, and was estranged from his family because of that, um, and ultimately does have some stories of reconciliation. But he ended up getting a, a. graduate degree in Buddhism as a Christian. And so part of what he was um, lecturing on was interfaith spirituality, the spirituality of of having interfaith experiences. Um, But I think really what it was, was um, how his interfaith experiences have influenced his Christian spirituality uh, and informed who he is as a follower of Christ. And one thing that he introduced to us is the tension between holiness and hospitality. You can imagine um, when uh, you're in an interfaith community or space, um, you value the holiness of your own tradition, the doctrinal commitments that you have, and yet you don't want your doctrinal commitments to make you unhospitable to the person you're with. Both are valuable, holiness and hospitality. And he calls for what he calls a holy tension between holiness and hospitality, kind of a yes and. And I actually think that's a better way of framing um, Methodist mediocrity. (laughs) It's not that we're not extreme and therefore not great at anything. Um, And it's not quite the via media. It's not a middle of the road thing. Um, It's more like a yes and, or this holy tension between holiness and hospitality. Methodists value holiness. We value personal piety. We value churchiness or growing into our life so that it's God-like, so that it reflects the grace of God. We value the means of grace, reading scripture, praying, giving. Uh, But it's not so that we can be holier than thou. That's not it. We have doctrinal commitments. We have things that we say, if you don't believe these, you're probably not a Christian. But we are not slaves to doctrine. Or, nor are we allergic to differences among our tradition. We value hospitality and the world as it is, loving the world as it is. We value mission. We are dedicated to God's preferred future for all people, but we're not willing to bring that future through violence or the imposition of our idea of holiness. We're not, in, we're not interested in commanding conformity. In fact, we've tried that and the results have been dastardly. We are not interested in offering an overly legalistic holiness 
because we actually don't see that as hospitality or love. We value hospitality and mission, but we're also not prepared to say that anything goes. We're not prepared to say that everything is holy. Whatever you believe is no big deal because when everything is holy, the Incredibles taught us this, when everything is holy, nothing is. And if anything, we believe something is holy. Someone has shown us holiness. And so even in hospitality, we strive after holiness. This is why if you've ever visited a United Methodist Church, you've visited one United Methodist Church. You've visited one version of this holy tension between holiness and hospitality because we're a tradition that values unity and diversity. Yes, and. Unity as the one holy Catholic and apostolic church and diversity as the the church that this community needs. We value grace and mission, personal piety and social holiness. We do ministry as saints and sinners and the sinned against. Our ministry is for yes and and. In particular, Methodist language and method, this is how we get a church structure and ethos of connection and contextualization. We are connected as one body of Christ and it's okay to contextualize for your conference. It's okay that we have four churches within seven miles of each other that are each a little different. We are still one church in contextual expressions. And ultimately, I think that's why the third word of this class is connectionalism. Now, any Methodist nerds in the room or in my life are going to say, are you for real? <laughs> like, connectionalism? What a boring thing. <laughs> like that's, that's, That makes your top list of three things about Methodism. We only, only really talk about connectionalism as a thing in Methodist speak when we talk about like bureaucratic processes and stuff. This is not that sexy. Like, Why is it making the top three? Um, but I have actually come to believe that um, it's, not, it's not just core to our structure, it is, and it's not even just core to our identity, but that it's actually core to God's identity. Methodists the world over are connected by common doctrine and practice. We care about holiness and good theology. You can't just believe everything. And yet we are also freed for contextualization because we care about mission and hospitality. We aren't going to be slaves to doctrine because we are actually servants and slaves of Christ, not doctrine. And there's a difference. The best picture I could find of this is a group of children in a circle locked together in unity, but each facing a different direction. We are a united church, freed for contextual ministry in our own parish, in our own sphere, in our own corner of the world. Now, connectionalism means conflict. That's been true of our tradition. Figuring out how to be different together has resulted in conflict. Remembering um, holiness and hospitality, if a portion of the body says, in order to be holy, we have to do this, and another portion of the body says, in order to be hospitable, we have to do this, suddenly you see the conflict. And we have had to wrestle through that conflict regarding slavery, regarding the ordination of women. In that context, in order to be holy, we can't have women serving as Christ representatives at the table. But in order to be hospitable, we need women who can do this. You see the tension there. Um, We also struggled around divorce. In order to be holy, we can't have pastors who are divorced. But if you want to reach people, you can't only limit yourself to the married pastors. We need more pastors than that. And so issues of doctrines get caught in the tension of holiness and hospitality Most recently, it's been in the conflict around human sexuality and gender identity. In order to be holy, it can only be one man and one woman, and we definitely can't have queer pastors. In order to be hospitable to queer people, they need to see people like them serving the bread and the cup. You see how connectionalism, trying to be one body with differences, means we're in conflict. It just comes with it. It's also part of being a family. (laughs) Like, 
That, that's just how it goes. It means we're going to have conflict. And so um, the question remains, um, how are we both holy and hospi- hospitable? How are we different across the world now and yet still one body? Again, Bishop uh, Hu- Hung Su Jung says, this is the holy tension or even the holy conflict that we're called to live in as a people. I'll pause there and ask um, what resonates or what questions do you have? Um, Does this sound like the Methodist church you know? Does it sound different from the church you grew up in? Do you remember any of those major conflicts? I don't think anybody was around for the Civil War, but you may have been around for one of those other conflicts. Tom. And I don't know if it's true or not, but uh, at the old church, there's a balcony. And there's a balcony where you can have your conversation. Black, Spanish, you name it, immigrants, they were allowed to come to the balcony to the service, but not on the main floor. Yeah, so Tom is remembering that in the Main Street Church there was a balcony, um, and he had served the balcony seating was reserved for black or racial minorities who would come to church. Um, I'm sure that if the, that there was a time where if people of racial minorities came to grace, they were shown either different seating or the door. Um, because that was just happening in any church. Um, there, there was a man named, um, oh, I'm not going to remember right now, Absalom Jones. And, oh, anybody, all my friends that I make listen to this are going to give me a hard time for not remembering the name. Um, Absalom Jones was one of them. I, pro- I apologize for not remembering the other. Um, but the origin of the African Methodist Episcopal Church is that someone came to church, was shown to the balcony, refused to go to the balcony, kneeled at the altar, and was kicked out of the church and ultimately started a new gathering and said, look, we're gonna be a church for black people and for all people. And if we're gonna be a church, we're gonna be a Methodist church because I believe that Wesley got something right. And so we have the African Methodist Episcopal Church and the Christian Methodist Episcopal Church that resulted from exactly that conflict. David. Uh, Google says it's Richard Allen. Richard Allen, thank you, Google. Thank you, David. Yeah, Richard Allen, thank you. Lord, forgive me. I'm going to edit the recording. So um, I want to offer a quick note on how this shows up in our polity. That's the church word for like processes and policies and our structure. Um, Methodism came of age around the same time as the U.S. Constitution, like the United States of America. And so generally, we are governed like a constitutional democracy. We have representatives from every conference that come to a congressional meeting and vote on legislation. Uh, Except, um, oh, and we have no pope, no king, no president. Um, We're we're governed by the people as the people. Um, Except we're not just like any other democracy. Um, For us, that, that is not necessarily a spirit of just trying to be democratically governed. It's actually intended as a, a way to be connectional, a way for increasingly everybody to have equal voice um, and access to the Holy Spirit and access to influence as well. Uh, it's intended to be connectional in a very Methodist way by methodically keeping the body together as one in the holy tension of holiness and hospitality, grace and mission, unity and diversity. The way this happens is, as I said, field preaching draws large crowds who are then organized into camp meetings or class meetings or into class meetings. Those class meetings are connected with one another into societies. Those societies grow into churches, which for some reason get called charges. Um, I think it's because a pastor was sent to be to pastor this charge. This is your charge, this congregation. Those charges are connected on a circuit because there weren't enough pastors to go around. So the circuit riding tradition is the one ordained person who rides from church to church. It's also why we still only have communion once a month because there used to be only one pastor and you only had communion when that pastor was there. And then we got more pastors and everybody said, once is still good. (laughs) Nicole. Yeah, good question. She asked, do any you know, Methodist churches have communion every Sunday? Uh, and the answer is yes. All my friends do. Uh, 
Uh, it is something that I uh, am longing to be able to offer and experience together. Um, and, and we can, uh, particularly because if you're a church that has a pastor, let alone more than one, um, you've got somebody who is authorized to offer the sacraments every time you get together. Yeah, Tom. When did the book of discipline happen? Why? Yeah, so by the time, so there were draft books of discipline uh, before there was the denomination. Because John Wesley would say, if you want to be Methodist, this is how to do it. Uh, and if you try to do everything he wrote down, you'll hurt yourself. Uh, <laughs> uh, but eventually, when, uh, when Wesley started ordaining people as bishops and, um, and circuits are getting established, then the book of discipline becomes more like a constitution of governance uh, and more like a, a handbook for churches to use in organizing themselves. So it's still, um, I would say, probably in the early 19th century. I don't know for sure. Um, somebody might Google that too. But, uh, but it evolved from instructions for Methodists to our governing document. Yes? Is it still doctrine that women can't be pastors? No. Okay. That changed. Uh, it's probably almost 50 years ago. I remember... Uh, I got asked to write a piece of music, a handbell piece, to celebrate the 30th anniversary of women's ordination. Um, uh, I can't remember the date right now, another thing to Google, uh, but um, I think it's been 50 years, give or take a decade, that women have been ordained in the United Methodist Church and in many of the main de- mainline denominations. I was raised by two Methodist clergy, a woman and a man. My mom and my father were, were both Methodist pastors. So pastors were assigned to a circuit, and then various circuits are connected to a district. Each district is in a conference. Each conference is in a jurisdiction, and each jurisdiction is in the denomination or the general church. So yes, this is all a bureaucratic structure, like a constitutional democracy, from township to incorporated city to state to so on and so forth. Uh, yes, it all looks like that, and it does have a practical, practical purpose. Um, but for us, it's more a structure, not just for governance, but for relationship. Across lines of difference, across differing cultures, we are united. We are a connection. There are other denominations that each church gets to do whatever the heck it wants. Uh, and does not necessarily, is not necessarily part of a greater body, does not necessarily have oversight of authority figures or anything like that. An independent church, if you've ever been to an independent Baptist church, that's part of the idea. Also a congregational church. Um, so we've got them kind of on the left and the right, in the northeast and the deep south. Um, this is a very American thing to do, say, nobody can tell me what to do. I'm going to do it my way. Uh, but we're more Catholic in that we say, no, actually, we need some structure to help us stay together. Uh, and reveal to the world that there are people who can stay together despite differences because we're all sinners in need of grace. These are, this is all structural stuff, but it identifies us as a people um, who have grace for one another despite differences, who are in mission together despite disagreements and conflicts, who are connected, connectional in nature because ultimately... This is what Jesus is like. Jesus is holy, the holiest. There is none like him. Yet he has also shown us perfect hospitality, constantly transgressing and tearing down boundaries between people in loving service and grace without losing his holiness. He gets his hands dirty in the world but never ceases to be pure of heart and to show us the heart of the Father. In fact, he illuminates the holiness of hospitality, that that's actually what holiness really is, that hospitality is holiness. He is made known to us as one God, and yet he is one God in three diverse persons. Our God happens to be a singular connection, God is, in fact, the loving, mutual, diverse, and yet unified relational connection of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the relation of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is the connection 
that we are invited to enjoy among ourselves in Jesus' name and bear witness to for the world. How can it be that people in Africa and Asia and the United States believe the same thing and love one another? Because God is like that. The Son is not the Father, and yet they are one. The Spirit is not the Son, and yet they are one. Africans are not Americans, and yet we are one. Asians are not Africans, and yet we are one. The very thing that we have seen manifest in Jesus Christ is the thing that we are trying at every step of the way to keep true in our own church. And it comes with conflict. And it comes with pain and difficult conversations. Generally, grace is not a church that's a high conflict zone. It has been. Thank you, Pastor Rudy, for dealing with the worst of it most recently. Um, But it remains a difficult thing to love one another when the things that come out of your mouth or the things you hear come out of my mouth don't sound holy to you. When we want to serve a holy God and be a people that reflect accurately the grace of God, we have high standards for what that looks like. And it's a hard thing to maintain those high standards when we don't see the standards the same way. It's a hard thing to remain united and connectional when we're in fact an incredibly diverse body. But that is the holy tension that we're invited to practice every day, every Sunday, every church conference, every committee meeting, every district conference, every annual conference, every general conference. We are invited to say, okay, how can we strive after holiness and remain hospitable to one another in the world? This was the practice of connectionalism, which I think is very near the heart of what it means to be Methodist. So in summary, to be a Methodist is to be a people of grace, and radically so, free grace from God for all through Christ. And to be a people of mission, responding to God's grace through ministry and service and generosity to the world, constantly asking who's not here, who needs help, who needs Jesus, who am I called to be with? Ministering as sinners to sinners and to the sinned against. And finally, to be Methodist is to be a people of connection. Rooted in the relationship of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and therefore rooted in relationship to one another. Discovering how we can together reflect the light and nature of one God in three persons, revealed in Scripture, proclaimed in the church, and made flesh in Jesus Christ. I will again say that all the words I just said, other other traditions and denominations will claim. Uh, We don't have a monopoly on any of this. I do think we have a unique story in which these three have remained core to our identity and they have been um, the thing that we've failed to do. The ways in which we have betrayed our identity. That's how you know they're really ours is when we don't do them Somebody says, hey, that wasn't grace. Or, hey, we are failing to be in mission to these people. Or, hey, I'm not so sure I feel very connected to you right now. That's how we know this has our name on it. Because it's the thing that we have conflict over. It's the thing that we love the most and the thing that we fight for. And uh, I'm embarrassed to get choked getting choked up about it because like who cares about denominations people think we're grace united methodist church like people like the world doesn't really like the world like people don't go around thinking about what a denomination is or why it matters and we're in a particular time right now where as i said in a previous class when people move to a town or decide to go back to a church they look at what's closest they look at what looks safest or like where the normal people are (laughs) Uh, then they find out there's no normal people. Uh, but uh, at a time when denominational identity seems to matter less than usual, 
uh, I actually find it exciting to figure out, okay, nobody cares who you are. Who are you? You don't have to figure out who you are so that you meet anybody's standard. Pretty much you have to be like safe, nice, normal enough, and people will give you the time of day. Um, But who are they going to encounter when they actually do meet you? Who are you as a church and as a person? I'm at the point where I'm like, I am Methodist. (laughs) I am United Methodist. And you may not be, you don't have to be in order to be a part of this because we value hospitality. Um, But I am Methodist and I'm excited about what that means. Uh, And it's nothing against any other denomination. It's that this is the denomination where Jesus found me and where I have reliably found Jesus. Um, And I believe that's true for people in other traditions as well. Uh, But I've been excited to share with you um, Jesus from the Methodist perspective and how that shows up, not just in our doctrine, but also in our practice and even in our structure and our way of life together. So what questions or thoughts or reactions do you have? Yes. So it's okay to still come here and be a Methodist even though I don't believe in some of the hospitalities. So Jim says it's okay to still come here and be a Methodist even though I don't believe in some of the hospitalities. I imagine that, I mean, you've been here for how long now? Three years. Yeah. And so we, this church, you've experienced this church hospitable in ways that you find unholy. Is that right? Yeah. So some of our practice has seemed to be not in keeping with your understanding of doctrine. Um, I think that actually makes you a Methodist. Uh, no, to um, stick with us, even though you're experiencing that conflict. Uh, because uh, that's the same thing that black Methodists had to do. <laughs> and the same thing that women called the ordained ministry had to do is stay with the people who called them unholy and be willing to lay down their life and stay connected. And so anytime any of us is feeling like this is my church, but they're not behaving the way I think God wants them to behave, like welcome to Christian history. Uh, I think that that's, that is what we do. Welcome to the Methodist church where we're constantly asking the question, are we reflecting the grace of God? Are we following Jesus? Uh, in both our doctrine and our practice. So, um, so yeah, I hope you stick around as long as you can stand it. And because you're saved by grace, Jesus will help you stand it forever. <laughs> uh, and, and so it won't be because of Jesus that it gets to be too much for you. <laughs> It'll be a question of how long do you feel like you're called to this particular community despite tension and conflict around doctrine. Um, A few years ago, I had a number of friends that left the denomination that became pastors in other denominations who had already sorted out LGBTQ stuff. And they said, the Methodist church is taking too long. I'm out. And part of what I don't, so I like naturally is like, okay, what am I going to do? And part of my sense is uh, I, I can't leave my family. <laughs> like, uh, I can't leave my family. And I also at the time was in youth ministry and had transgender youth. And I decided as long as they can stay, I can stay. Uh, and so, so part of being Methodist, part of being a family, part of being a part of a connectional church is, is doing that wrestling, living in that holy tension of figuring out how much, how much can I take how much am I willing to give? How, how faithful and am I willing to be um, despite conflict and tension in the family? Yeah. So I'm really not like denomination, denomination crazy or whatever. Yeah. So it's like, I can, those, don't, those decisions don't really have anything to do with me, whether what I believe or not, and that's not why I come here. Yeah. You know, but, and then, you know, this lady, she had a question about, well, does it say that? Yeah. 
good. I'm glad you're here. Uh, and keep coming to pastor class. Uh, cause that's when we get to talk about like the Bible says this, yes. And the church is doing this and, uh, figure out the ways in which that is openly consistent with the Bible and also openly contrary to a portion of the Bible. Um, that's, that's the good stuff. That's the fun stuff, especially when we can do it with grace. Mary Lou. Thank you. So if you didn't hear, Mary Lou says this, um, this holy tension has been a part of her whole faith life as a Catholic and Methodist person. Uh, and that sometimes it's been like, yeah, I disagree with both of you. <laughs> uh, and, and sometimes it's been like, yeah, I find holiness in both of you. And living that tension has been part of her life. And I thank you for your faithfulness to the tension. Um, there's one other thing I'll say, but I think I'll save it for the final word. So thank you. Sometimes I think I've been the laziest Christian on the planet. There have been, I have paid no attention to doctrine mm-hmm. or I just have. And even the Methodist Church I joined for the first time, you know, in Florida, and look at this and yeah, 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 yeah. And let's all just be good Christians. Just what I find here, what I like about the pastor class is that Get, I'm more engaged than I've ever been. And I get to hear, you know, the conflict and the tension that we all experience. I spent decades away from the church because of tension uh, between what I believed, thought I believed, didn't pay attention to what I believed, whatever it was. And uh, I'm just really grateful that, you know, in a small group, we can meet like this and talk about this because I've never experience this kind of conversation at church. Great. Thanks be to God. Wendy says that um, she called herself a lazy Christian, uh, and all of us can. Like, I mean, that's like, yeah, there's always more you could do because Jesus did more than all of that. Um, uh, But part of what I hear you saying is that um, in these classes and in the last few years, you've been able to kind of engage your brain and your heart uh, and been enriched by actually having the conversation and doing the reflection. And it's left you more engaged than you had been. Um, and yeah, I think that's, that's something that the Methodist Church would wanna to claim too, that um, you don't have to check your brain at the, at the door, um, but you're, in, you're invited to come on in. I feel like the thing that connects those three is love. Hmm. Sharon says she feels like the thing that connects those three is love. I have no conflict with that. Thank you. Last one. Well, I guess I have to say something about my daughter's past. Um, we were originally American Baptists. Mm-hmm. Grew up that way, worked for the state that way. Um, there was no emphasis on doctrine like the Methodists. Uh, however, we were definitely not like some of the Baptists of today. It was very organized, but we did our own thing. We didn't have back bishops. We didn't have somebody telling us what to do. They were there to help when we needed help. Huge on missions yeah. and helping. So it was so similar to Methodism. And I wound up with a Baptist brother-in-law preacher and a Methodist brother-in-law preacher. Nice. So 
I think about the whole thing. When I move south, I can no longer be an American Baptist. Mm. And that's when I started searching out the Methodist and the doctor, which obviously has worked better for my daughter than I needed. I just needed a church full of probably people. Good. Yeah, and part of what I hear in all of your comments is that like, part of what you're out for in finding a church or living in a church is the quest for holiness. Um, and not just like grow, becoming a more holy person, but being in holiness, being with whatever is holy, whatever comes from Jesus, and that that's what actually you value the most, and I think that's beautiful. The last thing I'll mention, um, we've talked a lot about Methodist history. Um, Methodist future, there, um, we have a future, and is the future without the United Methodist Church. Uh, because ultimately, I believe this denomination will cease to exist because we will be united in the kingdom of God with all people. Uh, so for a time, we are the United Methodist Church. And in time, we will be moved, all of us, into the one holy church of God. Um, on that day of the Lord. In the meantime, we'll be Methodist, but we look forward to that day together. Amen. God bless you. Bye-bye.